Hi, it's Mark Owen from Moose Market PR, the editor of Punchline Magazine, and welcome to Punch Times Talks, the big interview. Today I'm joined by Russell Watson, the English tenor. He's going to be appearing at Cheltenham Town Hall on Monday the 26th of November at 7.30, and it's fantastic to meet you, Russell. Thanks ever so much for joining us today. Pleasure to be here. Lovely sunny day outside here in Manchester. What's it like there? Well, it's absolutely gorgeous here as well, sweltering in, sweltering in my little office here. Um, thanks ever so much for coming. Uh, have you been to Cheltenham before, by the way? Yeah, I've been a few times. I've done the town hall quite a few times. It's always a, it's always a really good night. It's a nice, great, it's a great venue to sing at as well. Great acoustic value. So, uh, looking forward to it. Not least of all because you know it's been such a long time since um, I, I, I kind of partaken in a UK tour. So, yeah, really looking forward to it. So you made around. Is it? Uh, I think it's seven or ten albums. Is that right? I don't know, seven or ten, that's quite a <laughs> Well, I've got two different things. I think it's ten. I, I counted 14, and then I read your blurb again, it said ten. But uh, So you've it's just got... 11, 11 or 12, I think. And your Including, latest one's called 20, isn't it? It's called 20 because it's my 20th anniversary. So as a recording artist, so first record was released in 2000. Um, and we released that record at the end of 2020 last year. So obviously... 21 this year is my 21st, 21st year in the recording industry and 31st year of singing as a professional artist because I spent the first 10 years um, without a record deal. I mean, you've actually sung in front of some amazing people, the Maj Her Majesty the Queen. I once cooked for her, by the way. That's my claim to fame. Is that oh, <laughs> uh, you, you, you've sung for the Pope and two presidents as well. George W. Bush and what's the other president? Well... <laughs> There was a Bill Clinton night, um, and then there was Obama, um, and that's it, George W. Bush, yeah. Oh, and uh, I did sing, believe it or not, um, not for Donald Trump, but he introduced me on the stage, but that was long before he became the President of the United States. I was doing an event for, um, it's a nationwide television company in America called PBS, um, so we were doing a big television special for them at the Trump Taj Mahal um, in Atlantic City. And he asked if he could introduce me on the stage. This was back in 2002. It was a great night. I mean, not least of all, because I had um, the, one of my special guests was uh, Natalie Cole. Um, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a fantastic night. Mr. Trump introduced me on stage and uh, yeah, that was it. You also, you also met the Pope. Did he, he ask for a, a private chat with you, didn't he? Well, I did a private concert for Pope John Paul II. It was at, that was at the Vatican, um, which was one of the most incredible nights of, of, of my career, actually. Um, it's funny because at the end of the end of the performance, um, I gave one of my C's to one of the Monsignors and one of the Cardinals, and he said. You know, thank you so much. He says, could I get one for the Pope as well? So I said, yeah, of course. Anyway, he asked me to sign his, his CD. And I said, yeah, no problem. I signed his CD to the Monsignor. And then I said, do you want me to sign one for the Pope? Went, no, 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 don't sign the Pope. That, that's it's fine. I'll just give him the CD. Anyway, about two weeks later, um, I got a letter with, it was strange because there was like this, um, the red wax Vatican seal was on the front of this white envelope. I thought, blimey, what's this? So I opened it up and it was it was a letter from the Pope um, basically saying thanks for the gift of the musical CD. And um, he, he was going to give me God's blessings. And it was really quite something. Got it on the wall in the kitchen, as you do. As you, as you do, yes. Uh, absolutely fantastic. I mean, you, you didn't, obviously, you started, not obviously, but it's not obvious at all because you're, your road to where you are now has been, you know, not your sort of normal, traditional way. Um, I was reading up on you and you started off in a factory when you were 16. Tell us a little bit about that, please. Yeah, I mean, born in Salford, working class family, um, left school at 16, got a job in a factory, nuts and bolts. And I mean, I think that's what makes my story different from what you would probably consider to be the, the more traditional route into classical music is, is that I did come from a different set of circumstances and a background where most people wouldn't make that association with classical music. But I think that was one of the things that, you know, actually gave me even more drive and made me even more committed to the task of 
making it in the music industry as a classical singer um, because I was up against so many obstacles. It was like, well, what difference does it make now? There's that many obstacles in front of me. What difference does it make if I get a few more turn up along the way? I'll just keep forging forward and, you know, never taking no for an answer um, and just continuing to, to, to push on. And I, I, you know, I did, I was confronted with quite a bit of resistance at the start of my career, but gradually over the years that's begin begun to you know dissipate and disappear um and here i am now 20 years later still doing it and still you know i would say relatively so relatively speaking at the top of my game did, how did you get a lucky break was there a lucky break or you know what you know not being funny you're working in a factory how did you suddenly some people see see the see the road ahead they they get you know they or they meet somebody that changes everything or if you're a business person you can see that opportunity what happened with you Russell? I don't think there's ever a singular lucky break um, certainly not in my case I think it's a culmination of lots of different things around a particular period of time that all kind of gel together um, and with me there was very much a series of, of different things all catalyzing at the same time um, from, you know, performances. Uh, I did four concerts with um, Sir Cliff Richard at Hyde Park, you know, so we, four nights on consecutively, I was on stage singing Ness and Dormer and doing a duet with Cliff in front of 25,000 people. So in four nights, I'd hit a live audience of 100,000 people. Um, and then there was the sporting events that all started to catalyse, you know, starting off with, you know, singing at the last game of the season for Manchester United at Old Trafford, 57,000 people. Then as a result of that, they, they, they enjoyed my performance. They invited me to sing at the Champions League final at the, the Camp Nou Stadium in Barcelona, 92,000 people. And then the, the Rugby, Rugby Union World Cup, singing for England, Swing Low Sweet Chariot. All these things just started to roll and the momentum, the more I did... It was like a giant snowball moving very, very quickly. The more I did, the more stuff was coming in. And that eventually ended up with me getting my first record deal with, with, with Decca Records. It was just, it was one of those moments in time where everything, the stars collided and everything just was so beautifully lined up. Um, when I got the first deal with 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 Decca, we we you know was pretty much straight into the studio with the producer Nick Patrick on the release of the the record, which I think we released around about September of two thousand. The record went to number one in the classical charts and stayed there for fifty two weeks, which is a world record. Um, we 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 hit number one in America, Australia, New Zealand, Sweden, Germany, Japan. All over the world, the, the record was just going crazy. And it all culminated from all these things catalyzing. But when, when I think back, you know, at that 2000, don't forget, in sort of 97, 98, I was still treading the boards in the Northwest Working Men's Clubs. And it was as the spectrum was that wide, literally going from... Fred on the Hammond organ to Bill on the four, uh, with Bill on the four piece pearl drum kit singing, you know, to maybe 50, 60, 70 people in a, a smoky working backstreet working men's club to being on stage with a 60, 70 piece orchestra, you know, at the Royal Albert Hall. That was how, that was how wide that gap was. I mean, it was such a, a shift for me not least of all, a culture shift as well. I mean, it was a massive shift from where I'd been to where I was, and um, it was all very exciting. How do you keep your feet, you know, how do you keep your feet on the ground when all that's suddenly taking off? It must be really difficult, you know, suddenly it's like being let into the, into the candy shop, really, if you know what I mean. Initially, I think, you know, I had good... First, I mean, my family, Salfordians, all very grounded... And I think in particular, my gran was very conscious of the fact that I was going to get carried away with it all. And I'd ring my gran up, you know, at least two, three times a week. I'm in such a place where you, 
Make sure you keep your feet on the ground. Don't get don't get above your station. Keep your feet on the ground. Be nice to people. Don't get cocky. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, all right, I won't. Cheers, bye. Just my family, I think, in general, helped to sort of keep my feet on the ground. I think there were probably points where, I mean, I remember, I remember that the time I, I was, I was due to do Carnegie. We we're in New York. I was due to do Carnegie Hall. I just sang on national TV. There was an audience with President Bush and Laura Bush and a load of other American um, dignitaries knocking around as well. It was quite an event, actually. Um, it was. I think it took part at so the Ford Theatre in Washington, D.C., which is famous because that was the, the, the venue where um, Lincoln was assassinated. So I'd done this show and we were heading over to back to New York because I was doing my concert at Carnegie Hall. And we got this call. You've, you've just gone number one in the MOR charts. So, you know, like middle of the road, basically, and the MOR charts in, in, in the United States and the Billboard charts was like, what? We were number one in the UK at the same time, number one in the US. And it, they, they were saying, this is the first ever transatlantic number one from a UK artist. It's, it's amazing. I remember walking out on the stage that night at Carnegie Hall, and my first number was um, O Sole Mio. So I walk out on the stage and I'm Que bella cosa, na giornata sole. The place is absolutely packed. Carnegie Hall, the, the heartbeat of Broadway, New York. And I'm kind of stood there on this stage thinking, I can't believe this is happening. And it was, it was really quite surreal. But those are the moments where you literally feel yourself starting to gravitate upwards. But again, you know, back on the phone to Graham, Keep your feet on the ground, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely amazing. When you're singing in front of all those stadiums, you know, all that, that you know, so many people, are you aware of the actual people? Or, you know, I've, I've talked to uh, a few of the Welsh rugby kickers in my time, you know, um, James Hook, um, you know, fam famous uh, fly half. And, um, you know, he says, actually, you don't hear anything. You don't hear, you don't even see them. You're just so concentrating on what you're doing. Is that the same for you when you're singing in such a vast, you know, a vast amount of people? I would say that you become more aware of who's in your proximity when you're doing the smaller venues because you're on the stage and they're literally there right in front of you. So if I'm doing, say, I don't know, if I'm singing the national anthem of Wembley, I'm in the middle of the pitch and there's 85,000 people rammed into Wembley. I can't see anyone. I'm just in the middle of the pitch and I'm singing. But if I'm in a little theatre that holds, say, seven or 800 people, I can look around and see pretty much everybody from the stage. So I think you become more in tune with your audience because of the proximity and with the, the intimacy. I think you become more in tune with them if you are in a smaller venue and they're closer to you than if you're in a great big stadium or even the arenas. I have to admit when I was, you know, back in the early noughties, when I was, you know, singing at touring in Manchester Evening News Arena, 15,000 people sold out, Birmingham two nights, 9,000 people each night. There's a slight disconnect from the audience because you're up on a nine, 10 foot stage and there's a gap, there's a security cordon in front of you. And I always felt this sense of, well, this is brilliant having so many people coming to watch me, but there's a disconnect there because there's all this, I'm up so high and there's this big gap, you know, gulf between myself and the audience. I do like the intimacy of, of the smaller venues, I've got to admit, but just the same, I mean, doing the big, the, the big arenas and, and putting them the, the stadium performances is just magical because there's so many people out there. You can just feel the energy from them. You can't necessarily see it, we can feel it. Yeah, I mean, you're going to be appearing in, in Cheltenham. So what, what's, your, what's your actual show? Well, the show, for, the show for that will be a collection of material from the last 21 years of my recording career. The songs that I feel relevant to that period of time and songs that I feel that the the fans will have a connection with songs that I, I feel like 
you know, there's, there's certain tunes that I definitely feel. I mean, the, the likes of Valare and all that, the, the great Neapolitan repertoire, the Star Trek theme tune that I sang um, back in 2002. Th those are songs that I think will need to make an appearance because they kind of epitomise who I am and, and, and kind of, and, and that period of time during, you know, the massive success that I had through all the difficult times. The whole heap of repertoire that kind of defines that period. I mean, I, I, I was just on the, on the phone before you, you, you came on and I was talking to this lady called Maria and I said to her, I'm really sorry, Maria, but I've got to go. I'm actually uh, interviewing you. And she said, oh, he was, uh, you know, um, on I'm a Celebrity, get me out of there. And I just want to say a big hello to Maria. I'm Maria from Dean Close Foundation. And uh, she, she said, oh, please say hello for me. Please say hello. Can we do oh. one step further? Do you, do you mind singing her a few bars? Would that be a bit cheeky? Of? Or whatever you fancy. I don't know. <laughs> whatever you're going to sing at, uh, at, uh, in Cheltenham. What would I start with at Cheltenham? Probably, um, probably start with a solo meal or something like that. So, Kerb, Kerb, La Posa, Na Yornate Soli, Na Ria Serena, Dopo, Na Tempesta, Bell'aria fresca, pare gianna festa, che bella cosa una giornata e sole. Ma no, sole, più bello in me, o oh sole mio, sta in fronte a te, o oh sole. Oh, sole mio, stand from the ate, stand from the ate. <laughs> Fantastic. That's for you, Maria. Thanks ever so much. That um, just makes me feel of um, Elvis Presley. I'm not really done any warm ups today, so uh, yeah. Hey, mate. I've not, uh, done a little warm up before and give me the big kind out at the end as well, but I don't want to push things at the moment. No, no, that was absolutely super. Thanks ever so much. I mean, to get into the music industry must be extremely, extremely difficult. Um, what would be your top three tips for someone trying to break into, the, into it now? I think the first thing in the music industry that you have to be prepared for unquestionably is the fact that you're going to get a lot of knockbacks a lot of people saying no forget about it it's not going to happen um one of one of my all-time i think one of the all-time favorite um kickbacks was um the music industry is not what it used to be things have changed okay now that 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 was being said to me back in 1997 and it's still being said to people now, and it's been being said to people for probably 20, 30, 40 years. Music and yes, of course, the music in industry's changed, but it doesn't mean that you can't have a successful career within the context of the music industry. So just knows, don't, don't just ignore, you have to ignore knows. I mean, I, I got so many knows and so many kickbacks, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I think one of the other good pieces of advice would be very much, in my case, um, keep your feet on the ground. Um, I think bad behaviour, arrogance and ignorance particularly within the context of the music industry, it will only take you so far. People will only put it, it doesn't matter how big a star you are. I've watched some of the biggest stars come crashing to ground simply because, I won't name any names, but simply because of bad attitudes and because they think that they're untouchable, because they think that they can say what they want without any um, repercussions. And I think that you have to look at yourself in the mirror uh, on a regular basis because... I mean, in the early stages of my career, there was so much hype around the start of my career. Just make sure that you're not believing your own hype because it eventually thins out, wears away, and all that's left is you. And you've got to be able to transcend all that initial hype because that's the stuff that gets you there. Once you're there, 
that's when the hard work starts because attaining a career relatively easy, sustaining a, a career incredibly difficult, takes a great business acumen, a huge amount of work. You have to keep the, your eye on the ball. You have to be watching everybody else around you. And then my third piece of advice would be, find, I think this is the most important thing. Um, the music industry it, it is like any industry, but I think per square mile, there's probably more sharks in the water than there is with any other industry. And don't forget with a lot of businesses, one of the few industries in the world, the music industry, where you can consider yourself as professional, but you need zero qualifications. You don't need a, a degree or, you know, or a doctorate in anything to be a music manager. You just, I, I, I could, you know, you could wake up tomorrow, anyone could wake up, I'm a music manager, I'm a manager of music, you need nothing. So you just have to be very careful that you pick the right people and you're surrounded by the right people. If you manage to find the right people, which is, is a task in itself, um, you shouldn't go far wrong and you need to make sure that they have complete and utter belief in you as well because belief in the music industry is everyone. You can have the best manager in the world, but if they don't believe that you're the best, you're going nowhere. It's amazing, actually, because I just happen to be the president of uh, my own music company now. No, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't need any qualifications to do well, it. This, this is it. No, thanks. Thanks ever so much. I always ask my guests two other very, very quick questions. That's so kind of more on a personal uh, nature. Is there a book or a novel that you've read recently? I, I've re I read a few books, but I mean, it's, most of what I read, um, I, I, I like quite a lot of, I, I like some of the sociological studies that are knocking around. There's a book that I've read recently, the second, I think it's the second in the series called Freakonomics, um, which is about sort of social economy and, and that kind of things, which I find very interesting. Um, one of my all time favorite books is a book, a very short book actually called The Little Prince, recommended to anyone, which is, which is just a, a, a great little piece. It's only a short story, but it's a, it's a great little piece about life and relationships and, and different locations, journeys that we make through life. It's the, the, the messages within the context of the book are very strong. It's a great little book. If you've not read it, check it out. It's very short. You don't have to invest, invest much time in it, but it's a book that you can read on numerous occasions and pick something new up from it. Russell, thanks ever so much. I'm terribly sorry we've run out of time because I could talk to you forever. And uh, I just wish you all the very best on your tour, but hopefully it goes really, really well at Cheltenham. I'm sure without a shadow of a doubt, you're going to get a warm welcome. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Mark. Thank Good you ever so much. Bye.